So today, Wade Hundley from the National Security Department is here to talk about this and enlighten us on what is strategy all about and why it's important in, in regard to the issue of artificial intelligence. An example for me uh, of this is uh, <clears throat> we just finished last quarter the Great Powers Competition course and there's a lot of discussion there about the Chinese and Russian attitudes towards technology and, and military affairs compared with the U.S. attitudes and why there's potential conflicts. And one of the things the Chinese have said is that they intend to become leaders in artificial intelligence in the next uh, decade or so. And uh, as a consequence of that decision, they're already putting large sums of investment into developing manpower in artificial intelligence and also subsidizing companies who build artificial intelligence products in China. And uh, <clears throat> the US, on the other hand, is the leader of artificial intelligence technology and doesn't want to lose the symmetric advantage that it has or the asymmetric advantage. So the question is what to do about this. And that's right in the heart of the strategy question is how do we go about developing a, a, an approach to dealing with that situation. So Wade Huntley is going to talk to you about all of this today. He's going to talk a little bit about what's, what is strategy all about. He's in the National Security Affairs Department. He teaches a lot of courses. He'll, he might even mention some of them because some of you might be interested in those courses. And one of the themes that runs through all of the work that he does is the uh, connection between technology and strategy. So please welcome Wade Huntley. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Peter. I, I want to thank Peter also for inviting me to contribute to this seminar series. It's, um, I've been up there in the audience with you guys for most of this and have learned a lot about artificial intelligence, so I'm really happy to have the chance to uh, contribute back. The, uh, he, Peter invited me to mention some of the courses that I teach. I, I, I teach a course on uh, proliferation and nonproliferation of WMD, uh, East Asian Security, International Relations Theory, and I also have a course for the CSO curriculum on uh, cyber strategy and policy. So as he mentioned, a lot of the, uh, my interest in this topic comes from a long history of trying to think through what the implications for strategy are of various technological innovations, and, and most recently, uh, uh, what it means to strategize in the cyber domain, of which uh, the, the artificial intelligence applications are a part. So what I'd like to do today is um, try to think through some of the strategic implications for artificial intelligence at three layers. The first layer pertains to the direct applications on tactics, operations, and strategy. The second layer is the articulation of these applications at the level of strategic competition, and this is where I'll really get into the US-China dynamic. And then finally, I want to uh, talk briefly about the th a third layer, which spells out some of the implications at a more systemic level. Clausewitz's original formulation of the concept of strategy is very straightforward, almost deceptively straightforward, as are those of most of the uh, modern strategic thinkers who are in his, um, in his debt. But Clausewitz's seminal contribution also was to distinguish between dimensions of strategy. First, he did distinguish between the logistical and the operational dimensions. Um, he was one of the first major thinkers to do this. Uh, and this has, uh, invites us immediately to think about the, the different operational and logistical applications of artificial intelligence. But possibly one of the more important contributions uh, that Clausewitz offered was to identify and highlight the importance of the sociological dimension. He, informed by the experience of the Napoleonic Wars, Clausewitz was uh, keenly aware of the role of popular support for the generation and use of armed forces. In the late 19th century, it became clear that technological advantage was also a key element, a key dimension of strategic reasoning. Uh, the immediate strategic implications, for example, of steam engines and iron hulls uh, in warships had an immediate impact on, on, 
on the um, strategizing about warfare in the, in the late 19th century. In the 20th century, the concept of grand strategy emerged to try to capture some of the, the economic, financial, and demographic aspects of preparation and, and conduct of war. The concept of grand strategy also recognized a profound inversion in strategic reasoning. By the mid 20th century, strategists such as Thomas Schelling had come to recognize that the speed and the destructive scope of the capacities for warfare had reversed the typical relationship. Previously, in order to conquer a nation, to seize its territory, to usurp its resources, to enslave its people, one had first to go through its armed defenses. By the middle of the 20th century, states could now threaten, hurt, and even destroy their adversary societies without first defeating those defenses. What this meant for strategy, what this inversion meant for strategy, was a shift from the classical notion of the application of force for political objectives to a newer emphasis on influencing adversarial behavior, meaning either coercion or deterrence. Much of this new strategic thinking was driven by the technological dimension, the technical calculations, and the theoretical risk analysis that went into uh, game theory planning. But the socio-political dimension was also vital for a vital instrument of coercion and deterrence in this period. In the West, this meant sustaining popular support for the ideological posture, for the ideological competition and the posture of containment, even as it necessitated life under the shadow of mutually assured destruction. In the Soviet Union, in China, powerful mechanisms of social control, propaganda, and subversion were already crucial in maintaining state power. This interplay of the technological and the social dimensions is still seminal and important to forthcoming strategic implications in artificial intelligence. AI is strategically relevant for a really basic reason. It's relevant because it provides instrumental power. Some have suggested this is a potentially transformative development at the level of the invention of steam engine and nuclear weapons. Be that as it may, it is important when we think this through that although artificial intelligence provides a supplement and an enhancement to power, it is not in and of itself a weapon. It is a capability that enhances and in some cases enables other kinds of instruments of conflict and warfare. Most current applications are at the tactical level. This includes uh, the, the, the potential of AI to, to master difficult control problems. Uh, we're all familiar with uh, the, the advances in, in autonomous vehicle developments in the air and maritime dimensions in particular. Machine learning combined with image recognition has tremendous applications for target identification. Uh, the achievements in game playing have applications for maneuver, battlefield management, and target selection. Uh, one project that I'm particularly familiar with is, uh, is trying to develop rule-based artificial intelligence to reason over graph databases to not only identify targets, but to be able to explain how it reached that conclusion sufficient to, to satisfy the requirements of the rules of engagement, touching a little bit on what uh, B.J. Strasser was talking about last week. At the operational level, many of the applications at the tactical level uh, can be scaled up. And so when we think about the, the distinction between uh, using AI to, to manage the behavior of a drone versus a drone swarm, um, we're, 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 we're appreciating the, the, uh, 
the, the, the rise at that level. But the potentially even deeper application at this level involves the AI's capacity to undertake risk analysis. Risk analysis and situational awareness and an operational decision making uh, may be one of the most important applications at this level. Human beings are really bad at risk analysis. It's one of the things that cognitive research has really demonstrated over time. Um, it's one of the things that enables casinos and lotteries to make gobs of money. The uh, AI's capacity to find intuitive correlations and to reduce bias in risk analysis uh, may have one of, maybe one of the most important applications in terms of military campaign planning. What about the strategic level? The impact of the tactical and operational applications are all strategically relevant, especially insofar as those applications may shift power capacities and may develop asymmetric power capacities uh, or, or simply shift the balances of power between states. There are other applications that specifically pertain to the strategic level. Uh, projects currently underway would build artificial intelligence into multi-domain command and control capabilities. The earliest applications of, of these efforts may be in fusing and integrating sensor data to generate a common operating picture. But broader applications to grand strategy, I think, are more distant. And there are a couple of important reasons for this. One of them involves the challenge which many of the contributors in prior sessions have articulated of, uh, of the limitations of artificial intelligence so far to really grasp the nuances of human meaning, to really, to really um, fathom those nuances is actually very intrinsic to strategy. Most strategists have recognized that, that as the, over the course of, of events, not only may your means and ways all change, but your, your fundamental goals may shift as well. And, and, and at this point, artificial intelligence algorithms that, that are built as means of reaching fixed goals are really not quite suited to that kind of dynamism and, and that kind of, of nuance. The second challenge is the much higher levels of human trust that are entailed in uh, accepting the role of, of these capabilities in decision making. It's one thing to observe Move 37 in a Go game. It's quite something else to follow a computer's instruction to undertake Move 37 on a battlefield. These last two aspects are one indication of why the, inter the interaction of the technological and the social dimensions of strategy remain important in the, um, in the context of the applications of artificial intelligence. So let me now move on to the, the competitive level. The United States now clearly recognizes that AI is strategically relevant capability that, that, it, that its security demands development. The U.S. government is, is accelerating uh, the, the, the uh, refinement and application of AI capabilities in many aspects of national security. In particular, the, uh, the Department of Defense has issued last year its artificial intelligence strategy, which among other things has called for a, and, and, and implemented the creation of the Joint Artificial Intelligence Center to coordinate the efforts across the DOD. Of particular note to me in that strategy, which probably many of you are already familiar with, is its inclusiveness. The strategy calls for decentralized development. It calls for and emphasizes building partnerships with academia and with industry and internationally. It envisions, in fact, the DOD supporting projects that would have non-defense implications. This is actually uh, a, a very important strategic orientation uh, for, for these endeavors for a very fundamental reason. In the United States, and in generally speaking, the private sector is leading the AI development. Private sector funding for AI research and development dwarfs what the US government can provide. The US government also faces steep challenges in terms of personnel and talent recruitment. 
in terms of salaries, in terms of offering opportunities for being involved in, in, in the cutting edge of research. This reflects a reversal of what we became familiar with during the Cold War period. In the Cold War, particularly with respect to some of the most important um, developmental projects surrounding, surrounding missile technologies uh, and, and the space race, of course, the US government led the research. The US government provided the impetus and the direction that generally generated later commercial spin-offs. AI is the opposite of that. In, the, in artificial intelligence today, it's the private sector that's leading the development, and it will be the DOD adopting these commercial capabilities and applying them for military uses. This means that, 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 the, that the DOD and the US government more broadly are uh, only partially generating the, the, the resourcing for the development of these capabilities. And most importantly, it highlights the importance of sustaining public support for these efforts and for the incorporation of the, of the, of the commercial capabilities uh, for, uh, into the DOD. And, and most importantly, sustaining the support of the commercial partners who are, who are at the forefront of developing these capabilities. So what about the Chinese? A lot of people have observed that uh, AI's victory in the, in the Go tournament was China's Sputnik moment. And this is meant to convey the idea that that, 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 that Go victory woke up China to these realities and, and, and uh, spurred them on to, to greater development. It's an interesting analogy because the conventional wisdom is that uh, the Sputnik launch caught the United States off guard and that somehow this event galvanized uh, US support and, and, and catalyzed a national surge that eventually led to, to the uh, placement of, the, of, of man on the moon uh, uh, just a little more than a decade later. The reality is a little different. It turns out that, that Eisenhower had been accurately briefed by the intelligence community on the progress of the Soviet um, satellite program for years, that the, that the intelligence community predicted the launch within the um, space of a couple of months, and that the Eisenhower administration deliberately made strategic choices that were actually quite clever uh, to, to pursue satellite launch capabilities that it knew were going to be slower. The Chinese case may be similar, and I kind of suspect that the Chinese were probably not caught off guard quite so much as this analogy to the Sputnik moment indicate. What we do know is that um, shortly after, in, in the middle of 2017, China issued, uh, the State Council issued the, uh, the Artificial Intelligence Development Plan. This plan involved a series of chronological benchmarks. By 2020, China would be a world competitor in several artificial intelligence fields. By 2025, China would be a world leader in some of these technology developments. AI would also be a main driver in China of industrial and economic development. And what really caught my eye as I was reviewing this report was that by 2025, China would be making progress in the construction of an intelligent society. By 2030, China would be a world leader in innovation and would have advanced implementation of an intelligent economy and an intelligent society. China recently formed uh, what's called a national team of leading technology firms in China, including Alibaba, Tencent, SenseTime, Baidu, all of which are intended to coordinate the activities of those entities toward national security purposes. Some Chinese military applications of artificial intelligence are already apparent. China recently opened, uh, a couple of years ago, the world's largest unmanned UAV test site. Some of the capabilities for, for uh, Chinese drones have already been deployed. They're putting a large effort into visual identification, reportedly for purposes of, of identifying drones and also identifying uniforms. 
There are indications that China is applying AI to military planning, to operational decision making, and to command and control. There are also indications of a very large anti-AI effort underway, using AI to counter other AI. In addition to this, the counterpart to this, China's AI development plan emphasizes a two-way civil-military fusion. This is the term that, that you'll see coming up frequently. To which China has made dramatic advances in civil AI implementation, which in turn is immediately tied to national security purposes. Most notoriously, we're already familiar with AI implementation in social surveillance and in the social credit system, which, the, which uh, China reportedly uh, plans to have implemented by 2021. But the incorporation of AI is ubiquitous across the economy and across the society. One of the, one of the examples that, that I ran across that was most compelling to me is there are several entities. Uh, the leader is my bank, which I think is a branch of Alibaba. Uh, hundreds of billions of dollars worth of loans to small businesses using artificial intelligence to evaluate thousands of criteria. In China today, you can get a loan on your phone in minutes. Now there are estimates that those loan capacities are going to contribute um, significant percentage points to the increase of China's GDP. But the capacities for risk analysis that are entailed in those kinds of capabilities also have clear implications in the military sector, specifically for military planning and for the kind of command and control and risk evaluation that we were talking about a few minutes ago. This table provides a variety of indicators of, of where the US-China competition over AI stands right now. And I have to give a shout out to uh, Adam, who has uh, Adam Young, who's, who's a PhD student in our department, who's, who's helped me really collate some of this data. Uh, some of these data capture the, the uh, distinctions at, in various ways between the US and China in terms of where they've progressed along AI. There are many ways to, to uh, there are many variables that are applicable in uh, assessing the state of this competition. Some of them try to focus more on quantity than quality. Excuse me, yeah, qu quality than quantity because, because there are a lot of ways in which uh, US leadership is defined in terms of the quality of its achievements rather than the sheer scale of them. The general picture is that the United States still leads. Here's another representation. As you can see, the United States and China are primarily the two leading countries across a range of different forms of capabilities. But I wanted to comment in particular that this kind of snapshot tells us where we are today. It doesn't say as much about the velocity by which the progress of these states is moving, and it doesn't say very much at all about the acceleration of that velocity with respect to future developments. In that more dynamic picture, China is advancing. Uh, by one measure, for example, China is expected to surpass the United States in overall research and development spending on artificial intelligence within the next 10 years. Now, there are some different ways of, of cutting at this data that try to get at some of those issues. So, for example, um, looking at patent filings is often uh, cited as, as a way to indicate future trends and future development prospects. Uh, but there are different measures for that that make this kind of a, a, a difficult variable to, to focus on. Uh, research work is another good indicator of future potential. And in this case, uh, again, these data are coming from various sources, and so they tell slightly different pictures, but uh, what, what you can clearly see is that in all these cases, uh, the, 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 the vectors and um, directions of change are pretty clear. This, this is a different data source, which shows a, a slightly more ambivalent picture, but in all these cases, what you're, what you're seeing is, uh, is, a, is a context in which, in which uh, U.S. leadership is being clearly threatened. 
and that a continuation of the current dynamics uh, and the current rates of change in capabilities uh, do not bode well. One of the key indicators that uh, is often mentioned of, uh, concerning Chinese leadership is the uh, accumulation of data. Uh, data, as we know, is, is a primary driver for artificial intelligence training. Some claim that China will soon have 10 times the amount of data that the United States has. 30% of the world's total data by, uh, by the year 2030. The, uh, there's a, a, a particular Chinese tech leader who commented at one point that, that if data is the new oil, China is the world's Saudi Arabia. We can be a little bit more circumspect about this. Lieutenant, uh, Lieutenant General Shanahan, in, in, who, who's in charge of the, uh, the Joint uh, Artificial Intelligence Center, uh, has commented that he thinks that the oil analogy is a poor one. It's better to, uh, to that he, he thinks of it more as, as minerals. Some minerals are better for certain tasks than others. And all minerals need varying degrees of refinement before they can be useful. So, so, so we can imagine that that the advantage that China, China may have in terms of the gro gross amount of data um, has variable application depending on, on our, particular, our particular needs. Um, nevertheless, sophisticated, even the more sophisticated measures show that the vector is for a significant Chinese advantage uh, in the, in the uh, not too distant future. What about some of the other actors? Many of the indicators of this competition show European Union states to be strong players, to have a lot of, uh, of capabilities of their own, in some cases uh, ahead of China. Uh, if you take these European Union states cumulatively, uh, you find that in, in some respects they're, they're actually ahead of China as well. Um, however, on the one hand, this suggests that if we paint the picture in terms of the West versus the rest, uh, the, the state of the competition is, is not quite so dire. On the other hand, this underscores the importance articulated in the, in the DOD's AI strategy of building collaborative partnerships and international cooperation. So any of you who've had uh, specific engagements and, 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 have, and have run into some of the challenges of building uh, cooperation on technology issues with international partners will appreciate immediately uh, where that challenge is. What about Russia? You will have probably noticed a conspicuous absence of Russia from most of the data presented previously. In terms of the metrics by which we, we are comparing the, the US and China, uh, Russia is, is largely absent. In 2017, Vladimir Putin uh, sort of notoriously declared that artificial intelligence is the future and whoever rules artificial intelligence is going to rule the world. The development in China lags behind that hyperbole. Russia, just in October of this year, has finally issued a comprehensive AI strategy, fairly brief in its, in its terms. However, Russia does appear to be aiming at the development of artificial intelligence capabilities in key sectors, some of which they're using collaborations with China to pursue. One of them in, includes the kinds of technologies of, of language processing and image analysis that are particularly useful for propaganda and for information operations. So even if Russia is absent from some of that gross data in terms of AI development, it is not absent from the competition for militarily and national security useful capabilities. What about other states? Some have claimed that artificial intelligence will provide a uh, uh, an asymmetric capability that will allow smaller states or non-state actors to obtain uh, uh, greater uh, advantages vis-a-vis -vis the large states to, to pursue goals and to, uh, and to, and to uh, achieve their objectives. This might, be, this might eventuate, uh, but one of the things that we probably should focus on is how, even in, the, in that previous data, the sheer volume of resources that the states are able to bring to this development 
um, has played a crucial role. It is just as likely, and we will see, that, the, uh, that artificial intelligence may concentrate power among the few states that are able to, to, to deploy those resources rather than diffuse power uh, across other states and non-state actors. So now let me move to the, the third, more systemic level that I wanted to address. You've probably seen frequently already references to the US-China competition in artificial intelligence as an arms race. Now, as I mentioned earlier, uh, artificial intelligence is not an armament itself. It is an enabler and an enhancer of other forms of armaments. But the competition and the perception of the security and military applications of these technologies is driving research and development. Uncertainties about the future development fuels that racing. And the dual use character of these capabilities between the civilian and, and the, the, the national security sectors is also a primary driver for the arms race dynamic uh, in artificial intelligence. One of the important consequences of that dynamic is, the, is that the competitive pressures on states, on the United States and China in particular, can drive them to deploy and implement capabilities before they're fully mature. And we've, we've seen previous speakers in this course talk about some of the, of the challenges that remain in the development of these technologies. Uh, if deployed and implemented before they're fully mature, these systems can be prone to unanticipated behavior, to bias, to failure, and most importantly, to penetration and subversion. Along these lines, uh, in August, I, I particularly drew my attention, General Shanahan uh, defended the deployment of artificial intelligence prototypes, particularly under, the, under Project Maven, even when they were only 50% effective. And the quotation uh, that, that really jumped out at me, it's going to take a while to get performance that we want, but the warfighters are demanding those capabilities. <coughs> U.S. already subject to those kind of pressures. And then he also commented uh, with a certain degree of confidence that uh, U.S. rigor in testing and evaluation exceeds Russia and China. So in other words, if the United States is already pushing hard to get things into the field because of the competitive pressures, while still trying to maintain rigor in its testing and evaluation process, the Russian and Chinese aren't even doing that much. That's the exemplification of arms race pressures. What about arms control? This, some people suggest that we can reach cooperative agreements to limit these kinds of deployments, to make sure that artificial intelligence is not deployed until we're confident of its safety, we're confident of, of, of its reliability, and we have developed the kind of trust necessary to turn over important systems to artificial intelligence. The innate opacity of artificial intelligence functionality precludes arms control, which depends upon transparency. And additionally, the ubiquitous dual-use application of artificial intelligence makes verification of any kind of, of arms control measures exceedingly difficult. We've seen that in many other areas of, of proliferation in which we've, we've attempted to achieve uh, the kind of cooperative constraints on behavior. Uh, the the dual-use character uh, maps directly into the difficulties of sustaining those kinds of efforts. So arms control and cooperation, even in terms of rules of the road, um, may be extremely difficult in artificial intelligence context. The cyber domain is sometimes referred to, often frankly, referred to as an offense dominant domain. Since artificial intelligence is not really a weapon, some of these 
concepts of, of offense, defense, balance don't map directly into the artificial intelligence applications. But as an enabler and enhancer of a broad range of capabilities, what we've already seen is that the applications often assist offensive as well as defensive implementations. So at first cut, AI won't necessarily promote the kinds of instability, general or crisis instability, that we often see in offense dominant contexts. However, the technology is dynamic. We know that things are advancing. We don't know where all those advances are going to go. And that uncertainty in and of itself is a driver that fuels hedging, hedging behavior on the parts of both states, on all states. And we know that in human cognition, uncertainty favors offensive inclinations. You've all heard the expression, the best defense is a good offense. How many of you have ever heard the expression, the best offense is a good defense? Much less common. More fundamentally, because the applications are numerous and broad, they're also opaque. When it is hard to distinguish between the offensive and the defensive applications, capabilities cannot signal intentions. States do not have a capacity to build trust with one another on the basis of the kinds of capabilities that they're generating. The combinations of uncertainty and opacity of AI applications are therefore likely to fuel offensive developments in the foreseeable future, and therefore further fuel arms racing as well. OK. So these are my last points. Ever since Clausewitz grasped the role of popular support for Napoleon's forces, we have recognized the distinct role of the social dimension of strategy. During the Cold War, strategic thinking came to be dominated by the technology of nuclear missiles and the abstract game theoretic reasonings of deterrence. But the sociological dimension was just as vital. Public support or lack of it was a key ingredient of deterrence credibility for the United States, for its NATO allies, for its Asian allies. The collapse of legitimation that toppled the Berlin Wall 30 years ago this month demonstrates the potency of this dimension. Now we are at a new era of great comp big power competition. Like the nuclear era, the information age has created a new domain for competition. <coughs> Surveying the implications of artificial intelligence for strategy highlight the interaction of the social and technological dimension and its importance uh, today as much as ever. Whether it's the interface of the soldier with AI-enabled capabilities, the interface of the Uyghurs in Xinjiang with AI-enabled social surveillance, or the interface of the voter with an AI-enhanced computational propaganda. Everywhere, our biggest challenges and our hardest choices are at the threshold of the human engagement with this technology, not the technology alone. For strategy in the information age, the key terrain is the human brain. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>